emotional week. Um, and yet through it all, God is, is kind and he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, we are in John 21, starting in verse 15. And Emily has already read that for us. Uh, but I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get started in uh, John 21:15. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that your steadfast love does endure forever. We can't begin to comprehend how much you love us, even in the midst of our anxiety, even in the midst of the times when we don't even know how the next day is going to work. We know that tomorrow has enough troubles of its own, and you're already there, and you are in control and sovereign over all. Thank you that we can rest in you and we can trust in you. May we love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more. Amen. John 21, 15, remember the scene from last week. The disciples were out fishing all night, and suddenly some guy appears on the beach and says, hey, cast your nuts on the right side. And, and they do, and they pull in 153 fish, and John immediately realizes that it's Jesus. And, and Peter wraps his outer garment around his waist, and he jumps in the water, because he's not going to wait for the boat. He's going to get there. And in this, the resurrected Jesus is cooking them breakfast. I love that Jesus is cooking them breakfast. That is such a, a, a thing of care and love and compassion that Jesus has for them. And so we have that and we get to John 15. When they had finished breakfast, they were sitting around eating breakfast that Jesus has cook, had cooked for them. I, to be frank, I, I prefer our breakfast food rather than fish and bread, I like cinnamon rolls and donuts, but nevertheless, they, they ate breakfast. And it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, there are a number of things that happen in this conversation. And so it's going to seem like we're jumping around a little bit, but I want to break down what's actually happening so that we get a good picture of what's going on rather than missing some of the points. Start with the, the very first word of Jesus, Simon. Simon. Th that should trigger something, because remember that Jesus changed his name to Peter. Jesus said, you were Simon, you are now Peter. I am changing your name, I am changing your identity. And yet here, he calls him by his birth name, Simon. Simon. This sets the stage for what's going to follow because Peter tried to do things on his own and he failed. Peter did things his way and he failed. He did things as Simon would have done them and he failed. And so Jesus is, is bringing to Peter's mind his actions were Simon and not Peter. What you did was the old you. This is not the new you. This is not the saved Peter. This was the act of Simon. And I want to draw your attention, Peter, to the fact that you, you still have the flesh, but you have a new identity. And you were acting as Simon and not Peter. But I, Jesus, am going to reinstate you. And so he has to start with where Peter was. Peter was acting like Simon. And so this is a journey that Jesus is going to take him through to reinstate him in his own mind, to know that he is forgiven, and to remind him and the other disciples that Peter is a disciple of Jesus. The others are around during this time. At some point in this conversation, John doesn't tell us when, Jesus and Peter go on a walk. But here, it seems as though they are all together. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? 
Simon, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Isn't that a funny question coming from Jesus who, who really didn't like it when the disciples compared themselves with each other? When they, com- when they argued about who was the greatest? Remember when Jesus was telling them of his coming death and they started arguing about which one of them was the greatest, which one of them was better than the others? Jesus doesn't like comparisons, but he asks Peter here, Simon, do you love me more than these other disciples do? And so we have to ask what's going on. Jesus, why are you asking Peter this question? Why are you asking him to compare himself to others? Well, remember that Peter often compared himself to the other disciples and often put himself above the other disciples. An example of this is Matthew 26, verse 33, when Peter said, although they all fall away on account of you, I will never fall away. Jesus, all these other disciples may fall away. Not me. I got you. I'm in this. I love you more than they do. Remember that Peter was the one who fought back in the garden. Peter was the one who was willing to stand for Jesus. And yet he was also the one who denied even knowing him. Peter's pride needed to be addressed. Peter needed to be humbled. Remember also that Peter also made it very clear that he did not want a crucified Messiah. Peter had told Jesus, when, when Jesus told him that, they, that he was going to die, Peter said, no, you're not. No, I don't want a crucified Messiah. He was the one who tried to stop the arrest from happening. He was the one who tried to stand up and keep Jesus from going to the cross. Peter did not want a crucified Messiah. There was no place in his mind for such a Messiah. Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me for who I am rather than who you wish I was? Peter, do you love me more than these? This is really the question for us all, isn't it? Do you love Jesus for who he is, or do you love him for the idea that you have in your head? This is the question that we all have to ask. The first, do you love Jesus for who he is? That is biblical love. That is salvation. That is knowing who Jesus is and loving him as he is revealed to us in Scripture. Do you love Jesus for who you wish he was? For your own idea of him? I don't want a Jesus who would... I I know that Jesus doesn't judge, that he is just full of love and skittles and rainbows and all those fluffy clouds and things. That's the Jesus that I worship. Well, that's idolatry. That leads to damnation and condemnation. That is not loving Jesus for who he is. The question that Jesus is asking Peter right now, one, do you love me more than these? More than these other disciples do? And two, do you love me for who I am? Now, there's, there's been a lot made of, if, if you're familiar at all, or if you have read commentaries, or if you have heard this topic this passage preached on before, you may know that there are two different types of love mentioned in this passage. Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. Peter, do you agape? Agape means the ultimate sacrificial love. And phileo means brotherly love, kindness, affection. A lot has been made about this. These two different types of love. And yet we have to understand that even though it can be that agape is sacrificial love and phileo is brotherly love. It's where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. We have to understand that in the Gospel of John and prior to the Gospels being written, Even in the Septuagint, which was written about 300 B.C., 
The Septuagint is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was often that the same Hebrew word for love is translated both ways. Phileo and agape. Phileo and agape became almost synonymous with one another. They lost their distinction by this point. And so there's oftentimes in John where John uses these words and he interchanges them. For example, John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Agape and phileo are both used. The father loves the son. Agape and phileo are both used. Jesus loved Lazarus. Agape and phileo are both used. In addition to this, there are three other pairs of synonymous words in this section. Feed and take care of. Lambs and sheep. And there's two different words for no. Oida and gnosko, and both are used. Why is it important to, to talk through that and break that down? Because much has been made about this and we end up focusing on the wrong thing. And by doing that, we lose sight of what John is actually telling us. Right? I mean, imagine you're having a conversation and you're using words. We've had exchange students in our house, either growing up or um, later on. And there are times where we would use English words and they would have a completely different meaning to them. And when they do, sometimes it was really funny which I won't talk about, which I won't talk about up here. But they have this thing in their mind of, well, that's what this word means. It... <laughs> Sorry, i got to compose my thoughts as I hear Jaden laughing. Um, when we understand that words have a certain meaning and they actually have a different meaning, it changes the, the meaning of the passage. And so we have to sit and say, okay, what is John actually telling us? He's not telling us that, that Peter has a lesser love of Jesus than Jesus wants him to have. That is not what he's saying at all. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? See Peter's response, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now remember, Peter had this idea that he had a greater love for Jesus than the other disciples. You, know, you notice Peter doesn't say, yes, Lord, I have a greater love for you than these others do. Peter has been humbled. Peter has been brought down. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Lord, you know that I love you. Notice where Peter rests. He rests in Jesus. You, Jesus, know that I love you. You know that I love you. He doesn't say, look at what I have done for you. He doesn't say, look at how amazing I am. Look, Jesus, I stood up in the garden for you. No, he says, you know that I love you. Peter doesn't point to himself or his actions. Instead, he understands that he is weak, that he is unable to live out his love for Jesus fully. And so he rests in Jesus. After, Jesus, after Peter's response, Jesus tells him, feed my lambs. See whose lambs they are. They're not Peter's. They're not the church's. They're not, they're Jesus' lambs. Feed my lambs. As we are gathered here together in the flock of Christ, we belong to Jesus. We do not belong to anyone else. This is significant and something that we have talked about over the past few weeks regarding elders. The church and all who belong to it belong to Jesus. And understand the implications of this. You belong to Jesus. Not to a person. Not to a church. You belong to Jesus. Not to yourself. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus. He bought you with a price, and that price is his blood. This means that you are not to live the life that you think you want to live, but you are to live the life that God has called you to live. 
He owns you. You are not the arbiter of right and wrong, but you submit your own desires, your own thoughts, your own persuasion to Him. It doesn't matter what I think personally about a topic. What matters is what the Word of God says about a topic. And let me tell you, there are times, I know this is hard to believe, there are times in my life where I don't necessarily agree with what the Bible says, and I wish it said something different. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Serve others. Give of yourself. The list goes on. But I look at that and say, okay, I have to live my life according to what Scripture says. Why? Because Jesus bought me with a price. I am no longer mine. Notice Jesus' second question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? This focus is now solely on Peter and Jesus. He no longer says, do you love me more than these? He just says, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Again, Peter's response is to focus on Jesus and not himself. Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. My sheep. They are mine. They belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. First is the feeding. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. There's the feeding and the protection. Take care of my sheep, Peter. We need to be fed with the word and then be tended and protected and admonished. Again, these are the things that we talked about the last few weeks in the roles of elders. This is, his, this is a significant function of eldership, and it started here. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Jesus asks the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time Peter is grieved. Why is Peter grieved? Jesus had not scolded him. Jesus had not chastised him. But remember that Peter had denied Jesus three times. And this is now right back in his face. And he is face to face with his failure again. Peter, you know Jesus, don't you? No. You were with him, weren't you? No. You know Jesus, don't you? No. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Oh my goodness, what have I done? We've all been there, haven't we? What have I done? I've denied my maker, my savior, my Lord, and my God by the way that I've lived, whether it's specifically with my words or my actions. What have I done? And this is Peter. He's going through this right now, face to face with Jesus. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Do you love me? Oh. And the heartbreak I am certain that Peter had in this moment. And he, he goes a little bit further in his response to Jesus. Jesus, you know everything. You know everything. You know my heart. You know that in spite of my failures, in spite of the fact that I've denied you, you know everything and you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. I love this. I love this. I love that Jesus tells to Peter what to do. P Peter explicitly connects his love to Jesus in God's sovereignty. You know, God, you know that I am not capable of following you in the ways that I want to. And he rests in Jesus and his knowledge of everything. Peter, in essence, is saying, Lord, I have failed Yet you know everything, and therefore you know that I love you. Again, when you are reminded of your sin, and make no mistake, the enemy will remind you of your sin. Do not focus on your failure. Do not focus on yourself, on your inability. 
your actions, but focus on Jesus. That's what Peter does right here. He's talking with Jesus, but he puts his attention on him. You know everything, Lord. He is the one who holds you secure. He is your assurance of salvation. Your assurance of salvation is because of Jesus and what he has done, not because of what you have done. It's actually in spite of what you have done. Look to him. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Now notice that Jesus, what Jesus asks Peter before he commissions him to ministry. In each one of these questions, he says, he gives Peter an action. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. In each one of these, Peter affirms Or Jesus affirms Peter's forgiveness and his call to ministry. But notice in this that he has not called Peter to nouns but to verbs. Not to a a position but to an action. Not to, hey Peter, do you love me? Yes, well then become a pastor. Peter, do you love me? Yes, well then be a missionary. Peter, do you love me? Yes, well then be a missionary. No, it's, it's, an, it's a call to action. Do this. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed. Do the work of ministry. We are not called to a state of being. We are called to action. You, as a follower of Jesus, are called to action, not to being You are made into a being. You are given a place of being, and result of that status that you now have is to do. Because you are a child of God, live your life accordingly. Give of yourself. Feed his sheep. Take care of his lambs. Do the work of ministry. We all have a position given to us. And the members of the body of Christ, members of the flock. For some, it's under shepherds also in the body of Christ, in the flock. But all are called to action. And notice also what Jesus asked Peter before his call to ministry, before he commissions him to ministry. Do you love me? Love for Jesus is indispensable to the Christian life, and especially to ministry. If you do not have love for Jesus, you are not called to ministry, and you should question your own faith. Do you love me? Do you love me? We don't always feel love. We know that the great theologian Boston got it right. It's more than a feeling. It's a, it's a way that we live our lives. Do you give of yourself for who Jesus is? Do you love me? As we move toward elders, know that this is the first and greatest requirement for an elder. He must love Jesus. Without the love for Jesus, no man is equipped or qualified to shepherd the flock of God. And as we see throughout the New Testament, love for Jesus works itself out in love for others. As you love Jesus, you will love others. You will give of yourself to others. Thus, the first and greatest love must be for Jesus. Jesus revealed to us in Scripture. He is the one we love. Not as we want him to be. Not as society paints him to be. But as Scripture tells us he is. We go on in verse 18 and 19. And Jesus grabs Peter's attention, and he starts out by truly, truly. Again, this is an attention grabber. This is a way of saying, listen to this, Peter. Peter, when you were young, you could dress yourself and go where you wanted. This is going to change. And this is true for all of us, isn't it? When you were young, before you were a follower of Jesus, you could do whatever you wanted. Not now. You are called to a different life. 
You were called to a different way of life. Not to earn his love, but because you are in his family. You were called to a certain life. But Jesus goes on and he's more specific with Peter. Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will carry you where you do not want to go. Peter, you're going to be crucified. Now, I don't know. We're not told what Peter's emotions were at that moment. I can imagine what they were. If somebody told you, hey, you're going to be crucified, what would, what would your thoughts be? And you'll probably get a good idea of what Peter's were. Uh, that doesn't sound fun. I hope not. I'd rather not. Can we take a poll? Can we vote on this? Like, what can we do? But think about how Peter then lives his life. He is in ministry for over 30 years, and he is living faithfully. And he knows at one point, because Jesus told him, Peter, you're going to be crucified, and in your crucifixion, you will bring God glory. You will bring glory to God, Peter, by your crucifixion. Think about this statement for a moment. We often think that suffering is somehow bad. That we need to flee from suffering. If, if we're suffering, then it means that we've done something wrong, that God doesn't love us, that how can God ever be glorified in suffering? And yet Jesus looks at Peter and says, in your crucifixion, God will be glorified. We have this weird idea that if God is going to be glorified in my life, as Jared pointed out, I would like a million dollars. Like, actually, I would like more. I don't you know, I don't want to play the lottery when it's like five million. Let's wait till it's a significant amount. I actually don't play the lottery at all. But, um, but like we, we have this thing where everything has to be smooth. If things are rough, it means that God is unhappy with us, that somehow the gods are angry, whatever it might be. No, Peter is told here by Jesus, when you suffer, Peter, God will be glorified. And we see this throughout Scripture. This impacted Peter, and he wrote in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him be unashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. I imagine when he's writing this, he's, he's remembering this conversation with Jesus. You will glorify me in your actions, in your death, in your crucifixion, in your suffering. And again, think about Peter and his future ministry. He served faithfully for over 30 years, knowing that he would be crucified. He just didn't know when. Every day he woke up knowing that he was going to be crucified. And he served faithfully. This portion of the conversation ends with Jesus saying a familiar command to Peter, follow me. This brings us back to John 1.43 in the initial calling of Peter. And in this initial calling, there is messianic hope. There is anticipation that Jesus would raise up his kingdom, that he would rule, that he would conquer Rome, and that Peter would somehow have a great position of authority and fame and pomp and circumstance. So why the disciples argued over who was the greatest and who would have the positions of authority they followed Jesus thinking that he was going to set up an earthly kingdom. And now, Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, and the calling remains the same. Peter, follow me. The expectations now are much more well known. You're going to be crucified. You serve a crucified Messiah. It's giving of yourself. It's serving others it's sacrificing your own self and your own desires for the benefit of others. Do you love me, Peter? Follow me. We follow a crucified Messiah, and we are all called to take up our crosses and follow him. 
We have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Following Jesus is not an earthly kingdom full of ease. It's hard. It's painful. It's suffering. It's one that requires our death. But know this. He's worth it. Let's pray. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.